Anime Abandon is made possible by the generous fans on Patreon. Thank you. Hmm, is it that time already? Yuppers, it's my, yours, and everyone else's favorite time of the year, and personally speaking, I'm already knee-deep in one of my favorite Christmas traditions. Rewatching a whole lot of Christmas movies. Now, I'm sure most of you out there have your own individual lists of movies and specials that you keep coming back to Christmas after Christmas, but I'm willing to bet my bottom dollar that at least some of you have a Rankin-Bass joint on that list. Whether it's Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, or Frosty the Snowman, or Santa Claus is Coming to Town, they've all been on heavy rotation for the last 50 years. They're essentially a part of the American Christmas canon. But I've got a question to ask. Just how American are they? My more savvy viewers probably already know where this is going, but before we put the cart before the horse, I feel like we should make our introduction with today's subject the 1979 film, Nutcracker Fantasy. In a nutshell, if these are a family, then Nutcracker Fantasy is the weird, distant relative that's been missing for 40 years. The veritable Cousin Eddie, if you will. It's a flawed, cheesy, and at times very creepy film but it's also a culturally impacting and important film. Its existence throws a much needed wrench into the gears of pointless internet arguments, while also shining a light into a darkened corner of Japanese animation history. This is Nutcracker Fantasy. Part 1. It's the Nutcracker. What? As most of you have already gathered, Nutcracker Fantasy is an adaptation of Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Ballet. The basic gist of the story is here, along with the iconic music of the ballet performed by the New Japan Philharmonic Orchestra. A little girl named Clara is given a Nutcracker by her uncle Drosselmeyer, who, in the English language version, is played by Christopher Lee. I've made, oh, I've made lots of them, so many of them but people only want to buy beautiful dogs. Clara is gripped by dreams of mice fighting over her nutcracker and becomes embroiled in a battle between the mice king, or queen here, and a kingdom of dolls. But the similarities pretty much end there. In this version, Clara doesn't have a brother named Fritz, but rather a cousin. In the English language version, Fritz is changed into a friend of the family, which, as you'll soon find out, is a change for the better. This also doesn't happen on Christmas Eve night as it does in the ballet. Not entirely sure why this is the case, as by the late 70s, Christmas had made its return to Japanese observance after being culturally expunged and forbidden during World War II. My best guess is that since the film came out in the spring of 1979, the filmmakers thought that it wouldn't make much sense if Christmas were a part of the story. Now, you might ask, why not just push the release date back to December, and the answer is that theatrical releases in Japan are done on a scheduled contract basis, so there's little room for rescheduling based on budget and possible return. If they were given a spring release, then it's gonna be a spring release. Full stop. The film also adds this bizarre plot point about a supernatural being called the Ragman who goes around finding naughty children who stay up past their bedtime and turn them into mice. <laughs> It's a clumsy addition that really doesn't matter much in the English language version, but we'll get to that. There's also another side plot regarding a princess who looks exactly like Clara, who has also been turned into a mouse and lulled into a deep sleep, which is used to give immediacy and stakes to the story. Her dark power changed my lovely daughter Mary into that ugly sleeping mouse you saw. How terribly sad. The plot takes an even further departure as Clara is led to a mystic who tells her that to save the princess, they need to, well, crack a nut with a pearl sword. Let it remember, 
It must be used by a person with a good heart. Said sword will have to be wielded by Franz, the head guard of the kingdom, and the object of Clara's schoolgirl crush. As the battle commences, Franz manages to crack that nut, but not before suffering a curse by the Mouse Queen, and he's turned into that very same nutcracker. While the kingdom celebrates the revival of their princess, who reveals herself to be a spoiled, vain little girl... Here, look, he's just a piece of wood. If you want him, take him. I'm way too pretty to marry that. Clara is left alone with the nutcracker, determined to find a way to break the curse and save Franz from his wooden prison. Which she does! Frozen style. No, I mean it quite literally. I was told that only I could save him from the curse. Hey, lass, with love. Love. No! I'll save you, Franz! I love you! Maybe it's because I still have plagiarism on the brain from our last episode, but, uh... I'm watching you. With Franz saved, Clara wakes up in her bed, met by her uncle Drosselmeyer and family friend Fritz, who also just so happens to be the spitting image of Franz. Can you guess why the English dub changed the fact that he's her cousin? But no dub can ever change the fact that Clara is way too young for Fritz, regardless of relation. The dub tries to salvage this by having a more grown-up Clara recount the story in a canned narration, assuaging our collective discomfort by inferring that they got together in the future, despite Fritz literally getting down on bended knee. At the very least, the film is chaste enough that the English dub comes off as innocent and without any sense of guile. The Japanese version, on the other hand... cut is about 13 minutes shorter than the original Japanese running time. It does this by mostly paring down the animation and ballet sequences, which is par for the course when it comes to localization during this time. Now it's easy to want to chastise the localization for editing down the film, but sometimes... It's for the best. But on the other hand, its additions can be downright unnecessary. Please. I truly love him with all my heart. You stupid fool! But no less funny. Aside from the, at times, haunting and atmospheric animation sequences, the dub also scrubbed away important bits of dialogue that was meant to paint a recurring theme regarding Clara and her feelings toward Fritz. <laughs> Auntie, did you understand what I said? I'm too grown up to believe. Oh, really? That's right. The ragman's not real. The story at its core is about a young girl wanting to grow up and impress her crush, and then finding out what that exactly means. As she's told that the only way to save Franz is to accept the responsibility and sacrifice that love can often demand, Clara wakes up from her childlike dream filled with candy and rainbows to place herself between the nutcracker and a plunging knife. And as she returns to the waking world, the ragman wisps past her as if she is no longer a child that needs to be punished, and she wakes up to find herself being mooned over by Fritz. You see what I mean how the Japanese version comes off a little more... <laughs> This is one of the occasional times that a localization made the understandable call to change and omit details from the original source material. I mean, if only to save face from having the main character's happy ending involve them becoming a child bride. Still, it must be said that despite the film aging like a song on your local classic rock radio station, and the mostly lukewarm reception it had here in the States at the time, Nutcracker Fantasy was actually quite the hit in Japan. The film's producer, Sanrio, yes, the same Sanrio behind Hello Kitty and Agretzko, would re-release the film in theaters in 2014, celebrating the 40th anniversary of Hello Kitty herself. Not that the film is all that shy about its connections with Hello Kitty. What you're seeing is footage of said 2014 re-release, which is why the Japanese footage and audio sounds so much cleaner than the English dub. 
which had been out of print for so long that Discotech had to source the audio from an old Betamax rental-only copy of the film they found on eBay. Or so I'm told. But its most important impact on Japanese animation and culture is the influence it had on future animators, most notably Kunihiko Ikuhara. Now, keep in mind these are only my observations, I couldn't find any kind of interview where he plainly stated that he was influenced by Nutcracker Fantasy, but if you're at all familiar with his work with Revolutionary Girl Utena, particularly the film adaptation Adolescence of Utena, then it's hard to ignore the striking visual similarities, not to mention similar motifs. Welcome, Clara and Franz. Welcome to the Palace of Happiness. It is yours forever and ever. Come back to that closed world where you can be a living corpse. If you want a more in-depth look at the film, you can check out my episode on Adolescence of Utena by clicking on the link in the upper right-hand corner. But to distill it all down to the point... A film about a girl having to grow up and learn about notions of sacrifice to pursue the life and love that she wants, all mixed together with sword fights and European-influenced costume and set design? Yeah, I could totally buy a teenage Ikahara lapping it all up. It's to Ikahara's credit, though, that he recognizes the prince here being kind of creepy, and used his inspiration to make a point about how possessive the prince and princess dynamic can be. She is the Rose Bride, and since I am the current champion, she's my possession! I really hope by now I've proven my case that Nutcracker Fantasy is an important film from a Japanese-centric viewpoint, troubled and questionable as it is. However, this isn't my main goal with this episode. To me, what's most important about Nutcracker Fantasy doesn't lie within the contents of the film, but rather in the film itself, and what it means to our collective preconceived notions of what anime is. Part 2. Wait, Frosty the Snowman is anime? I mean, if your definition of anime is animation from Japan, then yes. Yes it is. Happy birthday! It's no stretch of the imagination to say that if you were a child in America, you saw a Rankin Bass Christmas special. But at the time you did, it probably flew over your head that the animation was done in Japan. After all, it's only through looking at the sparse credits at the end of Frosty that we know that the animation was done by Studio Mushi, the studio founded by Osamu Tezuka. To be clear, Rankin Bass themselves were not an animation studio. They were a production company. Their main contributions were hiring writers and actors, providing dialogue and sound effects for their partnered animation studios, as well as other bits of production oversight. If this is surprising to you, trust me, you're not the only one. For over half a century, the exact origins of Rankin Bass output has remained uncommon knowledge, to the point that a lot of us have taken for granted that they were the ones that did all the meticulous work required for animation. In fact, Rankin Bass specials were mostly animated by Japanese studios, as they were pioneers in the now ubiquitous practice of outsourcing. Today, it's become common practice that animated features are outsourced to whoever can offer their services the cheapest, and that includes anime. As such, I find the definition of anime being animation from Japan is becoming more and more irrelevant, if not flat out misinformed. Further, the definition is becoming more reliant upon nebulous notions of aesthetic and recurring tropes. And yet, this broad topic of discussion doesn't seem to want to include stop-motion animation, as if it somehow isn't animation. This lack of a concrete definition, as well as the apparent refusal to actually commiserate in good faith on what anime even is, has engendered a sense of irony poisoning, as we still see canned shitposts about Cory in the House being a supposed favorite, or King of the Hill. Funny, yes, but not exactly helping the discourse. Not to mention, the lack of meaningful conversation surrounding the topic has left a lot of worthy stop-motion animators from being adopted into the anime canon. To put a point on it, Wikipedia's entry on anime is completely dismissive of the history of Japan's stop-motion industry. They don't include stop-motion in the broad definition at the top of the entry, and would go on to incorrectly claim that, quote, in the 21st century, the use of other animation techniques is mostly limited to independent short films, including the stop-motion puppet animation work produced by Tadehito Mochinaga, Kihachiro Kawamoto, and Tomoyasu Murata. Mochinaga and Kawamoto's work were mostly in the 20th century, not the 21st. 
At least with Frosty the Snowman, there's a stronger case of its placement in the anime canon because no one in their right mind would claim that it somehow isn't animation. But at the time, Rankin Bass would have no way of knowing their dubious role in the pointless, never-ending semantics argument over the existence of anime, as they were focused on the practical. Rankin Bass Productions were always under a tight budget, but instead of going the route of Hanna-Barbera, distilling down animation to limited movements and canned loops, Rankin Bass employed cheaper labor through a Japanese representative that made their acquaintance at a trade commission in 1958. Through their connection, Rankin Bass employed several Japanese animation studios over the coming years, including Studio Mushi, Toei, and the stop-motion studio MOM Production. The same studio behind Nutcracker Fantasy, which is why the film looks like a Rankin Bass special, even though the film had nothing to do with Rankin Bass. Just like with Frosty the Snowman, broadcasts of MOM Productions' work were very tight-lipped about who was actually making the sausage, as it were. The specials were very keen to point out the voice cast, the writers and producers, but as to who actually made these sets and dolls and who exactly moved them were never properly credited. In Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, for instance, only the chief animator and founder of MOM Production was credited as Tad Mochinaga. That would be the same Tadahito Mochinaga that I mentioned earlier. He's an incredibly important animator whose influence is still felt today, as you'll soon see. What's more, undue credit was often given to people in prominent positions. The title of Associate Director in the credits of Rudolph was given to Kizo Nagashima, even though he was a suit who oversaw the money on the Japanese side of production. He had no creative input on the animation, and yet he is one of only two people involved in the Japanese side of production whose names are in the credits. Even the name MOM Production is nowhere to be found. There's also no mention of MOM production anywhere in the credits of Santa Claus is Coming to Town or The Little Drummer Boy, despite the fact that they're both their work. Thankfully, we live in a time where crediting is taken more seriously, though by no means is it perfect. And despite the notion of anime still being a foggy, ill-defined mess, it does prove to have a use, outside of marketing. You see, having a term for a kind of animation allows the fostering of a community, and thus a compulsory need for preserving the community and its history. It follows a certain logic. By calling it anime, we can call ourselves fans of anime, which gives us identity and therefore a personal stake in its history and its future. And with only a cursory glance at the countless fan sites and wikis, digital archives and restoration jobs, and yes, even the memes, it's obvious that we have an investment in our community, and we help preserve it with every digital record we make. So with all that in mind, we should have the tools at our disposal to help give credit to the people that made these specials a reality. Right? Part 3. What We Lose. If you try to look up MOM production today, you're not going to find a Wikipedia page or an Anime News Network page. Hell, if you looked up Nutcracker Fantasy on Wikipedia, it will still say that the cinematography was done by Rankin Bass. You might find a weirdly disjointed page on a parody wiki, a lot of which is just parroting what's on Rankin Bass's Wikipedia page. We do know that MOM Production changed its name to Video Tokyo Production after Mochinaga left the company. But with such a generic sounding title, trying to look it up for information leads toward incorrect results. For its part, IMDb has the most complete credits list for Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer that I managed to find, which in no doubt is thanks to the existence of the making of the Rankin Bass holiday classic, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer by Rick Goldschmidt, one of the only recorded first-hand accounts of the making of the special we have, and the source of a lot of information I've imparted upon all of you. However, the credits list for Santa Claus is Coming to Town is paltry and nowhere near complete, and the state of the little drummer boy is even worse, misspelling the animation director's name and even having the gall to state that it's a complete list. The man's name, by the way, is Takeo Nakamura, the same man who directed Nutcracker Fantasy. I wish I could tell you more about him, but there's almost nothing online about him. I couldn't even find out if he's still alive. Because the majority of their work has gone uncredited, swept away to make room for the producers and the cast, 
and because the conversation revolving around anime doesn't seem to want to include stop-motion animation, a lot of us overlook the tremendous contributions that hundreds of sadly anonymous Japanese animators have made to our Christmas traditions. Well, I grew up liking those stories like, uh, you know, every uh, Christmas you'd watch things like uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer or uh, like The Grinch That Stole Christmas. Those were my favorite uh, like holiday specials when I was growing up. From inspiration to parody to homage and everything in between, MOM production has left an indelible mark on American pop culture and animation history. From directors like Henry Selleck and Nick Park to all the incredible artists and animators at studios such as Leica and Artman Animations, they're all standing on the shoulders of people whose names we don't know. I'll be honest with all of you, while I was doing my research for this episode, I got angry. Like, to tears. I was so angry. It just seemed so unfair that so many people worked so hard on something so important, only to go forgotten. If you're at all familiar with stop motion animation, you know just how time consuming and tedious it is. It is exacting, precise work in today's era, and infinitely more so in the 1960s. Animators, cameramen, set designers, puppet builders, and dozens of others all working with that same Japanese ethic of dying at your desk would all sleep at the studio just to wake up and get back to work all so they can make deadlines. That what they all made would stand the test of time feels downright hollow if we also don't get to know who made it. We may be able to know Tadahito Mochinaga's name and who he was, but do we know Hiroshi Tabata, who would go on to be the chief animator of a lot of Rankin Bass's sequels and whose photos here are some of the only artifacts we have of these arduous productions? Do we know Hirokazu Minagishi's name? Or Ichiro Komuro's name? Do we know Koichi Oikawa or Fumiko Magari? Do we know Reiko Yamagata, Kyoko Kita, or Seiichi Araki? Do we? How could we? When we talk about what is or isn't anime, we don't consider what we're leaving out when we make the distinction, even if what we're leaving out is as foundational as MOM Productions work. Yes, I would argue that Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, The Little Drummer Boy, Santa Claus is Coming to Town, and all their sequels, and yes, Nutcracker Fantasy, are all anime. And they need to be remembered as such, for the sake of everyone who lost countless nights at the desk and had their name forgotten for their efforts. I honestly didn't expect the ending of this episode to have such a sobering feel to it, but it can happen when you go digging. At the very least, I hope a lot of us can come to a better understanding of something that we probably took for granted. Uh, yeah, this is kind of unprecedented, isn't it? Um, I had an ending planned for uh, the end of this episode, and um, I was going to go through with it, but uh, while I was editing this very episode that you're watching right now, uh, I found out that... Nutcracker Fantasy has been officially listed as out of print. Merry Christmas indeed. Um, I, uh, I really don't feel too pithy right now. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to have the list of my patrons who've contributed as well as some links to uh, some other episodes of Anime Abandoned if you want to watch something Christmas related to. I'll be back next year. Happy holidays.